Dr. Elizabeth Lev is an art historian and an author living in Rome where she offers tours of the Eternal City's treasures and is on the teaching staff at the Pontifical University of the Angelicum as well as Christendom College. She is the author of three books, including the book tonight, How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, which is available for purchase and signing after tonight's event, and has published articles in numerous publications, including First Things and Inside the Vatican Magazine. She's traveled the world speaking on art, has presented a TED Talk on the Sistine Chapel, and has appeared on many TV and radio programs, including ABC's Nightline and The Today Show. With all that on her plate, uh, she took time out of her busy schedule here in New York. She's been doing tours at the Met and speaking to groups about art. So we're just so deeply grateful that she carved out a little time to be with us tonight. Without further ado, it is my great privilege to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Lev. All right, well, well, thank you so much for coming out. On, I think it's Sunday. I've been traveling so much I don't really know what day it is anymore. And um, I uh, am uh, really kind of pleased to be discussing this book again. It, it's um, a project that um, actually was my graduate subject. I uh, went to University of Bologna for my, my graduate degree. And um, at the University of Bologna, you don't get to choose <laughs> your uh, thesis subject, they, they tell you. And, um, and so I was told I was going to be doing this little obscure Bolognese group that worked on the Counter-Reformation Church in Rome, and I thought to myself, well, lucky me, the American in Bologna. And I had no idea how incredibly helpful um, the, those studies would end up being. It seemed kind of like just, you know, chugging through something to get a piece of paper. And it ended up being something that really gave me a way to navigate and understand uh, many things about the contemporary church, actually. And uh, I started teaching Baroque art. Um, I've been teaching it for about 20 years and began to realize that the Baroque and the fun of Bernini is actually very, very, very closely connected to the art of the Counter-Reformation. And that the art, these beautiful things that people see in Rome, the things you do kind of between one gelato and another, uh, they are uh, actually meant to teach us in a very, very special way. So I guess um, what I'm getting at is as we rolled into 19, uh, to 2017, uh, it began to occur to me that uh, the situation in the Catholic Church looked an awful lot like it did back in 1517. We're gearing up to celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, and just like 500 years ago, people are yelling at each other and people saying, oh, you're not this and you're not that, and lots and lots and lots of arguments, and what does the church teach, and a lot of confusion about what the church taught. And all of a sudden, I realized that, wait a minute, I actually know what they did last time this happened. So let's just start from the very first premise. I always think it's kind of an interesting way to begin this story, is to find out that uh, the way that, oops, sorry, okay, I'm gonna fight with the technology the whole way through, so don't, this is par for the course. I think some of you have actually, oh wait, I've got a stu former student in here who will tell you that my life at the Angelicum was a constant fight with the, um, with the slideshow, because after all, the motto of the Angelicum is, <laughs> the motto of the Vatican is yesterday's technology, tomorrow, so. The, um, uh, so this, this is kind of an interesting way of thinking about things. You know, this, this whole, how do we describe a Christian? How does Jesus tell us we're supposed to be recognized by the way we love one another? And yet 1517 rolls around, and that's not what this is looking like. We start out with, of course, the famous these 95 theses that were hammered up on the cathedral door in Wittenberg by Martin Luther. I don't think he had any idea of the, the can of worms or the Pandora's box he was actually opening. But the next thing you know, we have, starting with Martin Luther, we move on to Calvin. We have this sort of one thing after another. The church is fragmented in two. It's fragmenting in three. It's fragmenting in four. Lots Lots and lots and lots of different teachings. So, you know, one person says this, another person says this, another person says, how are you supposed to navigate all that? And what is worse, uh, to add, the, add to the problem is a brand new technological invention. And that new invention is the printing press. It is impossible to understate how much the printing press changed things. Because when you think about it, by the time it gets to be about 1530, 1540, 150 million documents are circulating all around Europe every year, and a great many of them have to do with religion. And so there you are, you know, reading one piece, reading another piece, reading another article. Doesn't that sound a bit like today? Lots and lots and lots of information, 
all coming in from different directions. And we have lives. We have to get up in the morning. We've got to get the kids to school. We've got to get our stuff done. How are we going to filter through all this information? And so this happens in the mid-16th century. People are bombarded with information. There are tons and tons and tons of different articles, different beliefs, different systems that are being put forward. And then to make matters worse, it turns out the Protestants are really good at writing clickbait titles, right? I mean, they write the best stuff. And so, like, the titles, are, how are you not going to pick up and read a pamphlet that's titled On the Institution of the Papacy Founded by the Devil? I mean, <laughs> I'd, I'd probably click, right? <laughs> so it sounds, it's so, it's so catchy. And every time the Catholics are trying to respond, it gets to be a kind of a long-winded explanation of dum da dum da dum da dum da dum And so every time the Catholics have to respond to a question of doctrine or, or dogma, the precision that is required when you're writing about theology makes the answer nowhere near as much fun as the pamphlet. And so the church needs to find some solutions in order to be able to create uh, a conversation. So what starts happening is people, be, be, people start using stronger and stronger language. And so we find, these are actual quotes, by the way, we find this sort of constant name calling that goes back and forth and back and forth. It's, these are these terms that people are using to each other. So you start out with a very kind of violent and hostile language. And then from there, it actually moves on to violence. So we have St. Saint Bartholomew's May Day Massacre of the Huguenots, followed by the, mar actually it's the martyrdom of the girl, or the Gorka martyrs are first, and then the St. Ma Bartholomew's Day Massacre is second. But you have Catholics killing Protestants, Protestants killing Catholics. I mean, what, when is this ever going to end? And so trying to reestablish a way to communicate is, is something that the just, it's imperative for the church. Trying to communicate in a way that people will be able to understand and more importantly own Catholic doctrine and dogma is something that they're really looking for. How do we do that? Because you can't really ask a busy farmer, could you please read this giant treatise by Robert Bellarmine and that way you can explain to your friends why the real presence is in the sacrament. You need to feel like you own it in some other way. And so the church actually does have ways of doing this. We have have it in art. But the church had actually distanced itself from art. There had been a number of issues that happened in the mid-16th century, like a lot of naked figures in inappropriate places. And the church was beginning to think, maybe, maybe, maybe we should just take a step back from patronizing art. But as the situation grew more and more and more serious, the church realized it is time for us to take the art question in hand. And so the Council of Trent, which went on for 25 different sessions. In the final session, I always like to point this out because sometimes art historians, we get a little full of ourselves and we think like somehow we are the be all end all of the existence of the Catholic Church. So this is the moment where sort of I'm required by humility to tell you that the Council of Trent, which is this extended council over 20 years in which the church fathers discuss all the questions that are pertinent of the church after the Protestant Reformation, the question of art took place during the 25th fifth and final session, uh, December 4th of 1563, after they had finished talking about saints, relics, and probably who was going to buy the coffee at midday, they finally said, oh yeah, what else? Should, oh, let's talk about art. But the fact of the matter is they did talk about it. I'm just happy that they talked about it. They did talk about it, and they decided that the church would continue to actively patronize art. They would try to help artists understand that the art to be produced for churches would need to be clear. You need to understand what's happening in the picture. It's not about how clever the artist is and you can't figure out who St. Stephen is in the martyrdom of St. Stephen. It has to be accurate. You can't go making up stories from the Bible because you think it would be cool if it looked that way. And most importantly, and yet most in the most difficult part, it has to stimulate towards piety. And I get the feeling there are probably a lot of artists in this room or people who hang around with artists. And I just, I'm just wondering, if I, if I give you a piece of paper and a pencil and say, okay, could you uh, stimulate me towards piety? How are you going to do that? So it's going to take a generation for the artists to really begin to figure out how exactly to carry this out. But they will. And they will find a way to use art to help people work together. So think about it this way. When we start arguing about an idea, we tend to be looking at each other and we argue and our voices get louder and we start to, we start to run out of arguments and start to use more and more sort of questionable uh, accusations. Whereas what happens when we look at a work of art, right? We all stand together and we all look at something beautiful. 
Art gives us the opportunity of standing side by side, focused on something that is outside of ourselves <coughs> and something that we can learn from. So it's a really fundamental and extremely important thing about art. Art will be, in, art will be mm, called into service on the part of the church to deal with the three most pressing problems that the church has, and this is what I was uh, particularly interested in in the book. Uh, number one is the problem of sacraments. Uh, number two is the problem of intercession, and number three is the problem of cooperation in salvation, which is problematic to explain, let alone paint. And so for the remaining time, or this little talk is going to be, I'm going to take you through three of those sections, and I'm going to explain to you, I'm going to show you works of art that perhaps are very famous, very well known to you. Actually, I'm taking one of my favorite artists, Caravaggio, who's on paper maybe not the person that you would be choosing to... Uh, be the face of the Counter-Reformation, but I'm going to be looking at uh, three works of art that tackle these three questions and really get a sense of how art really s was in the service of the church in order to reinforce the faith, teach the faithful all the while so successfully that people stand in line 400 years later in order to go see these works of art. So this was a tremendously winning proposition that they put together. So let's start with the sacraments. And I'm going to start with, obviously there are seven, but we're going to deal with the one that was the most under fire, and that is the... Uh, that it was really a sacrament of the Eucharist and the sacrament of penance. We're going to be looking at the question of the Eucharist. And of course, in the midst of the denials of the real presence in the Eucharist and this idea of, yeah, why on earth should I believe that there is you know, the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist? It's probably just a symbol. All these different proliferation of teachings. And then when you try to get a Catholic, you tried to get a Catholic to explain, well, what does that mean? You'd have a lot of, well, you know, well, we, 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 we just believe it, right? So to order to own this, in order to feel much closer to the idea of the body of Christ, who do they call in but none other than Caravaggio? And I do want to point out Caravaggio is hands down the absolute worst person on paper to be hired for the Counter-Reformation. I mean, every day, that guy had lived during the Renaissance. I mean, let's just say he had not been born in 1571, but had been born in, oh, I don't know, 1500. He never would have had a career. He couldn't draw. He couldn't fresco. He can't do half the stuff that Raphael and Michelangelo can do. So to begin with, just for his sheer technical skills, had he been born in the Renaissance, that guy would have been making pizza until the day he died. But the fact of the matter is, he was born in this perfect moment when the church is kind of looking around, looking for someone that can help us get a new idea of what we're going to do or how we're going to, we need new people, new blood, new ideas. Caravaggio is perfect. Caravaggio is perfect because of the fact that he's a very edgy, restless character and his art becomes captivating for this reason. He's also not exactly a very good poster child because his life is known to us through police records of which there are no less than 40. Uh, most of which are for aggression. So I understand that one might be looking at this guy going, hmm, are we sure we want him representing the church? And yet, what a successful gamble that was. This particular painting, which I personally consider his most successful religious work, was commissioned by the greatest artistic gamblers there were. The Oratorian Order, founded by Philip Neri, had a great sense of finding artists. They had a really good eye for finding artists that could catch the attention of the faithful. So Caravaggio, this guy in and out of jail, constantly in trouble, gets hired by the order that began the custom of the 40 hours devotion. So the moving of the Blessed Sacrament for 40 hours of, d of, of, of Eucharistic adoration from place to place to place, so that by 1600, the, the, the Blessed Sacrament when it was moved from all the churches and venerated or adored all during all during the calendar year. And this is the order that began it. And so he gets hired to work in their mother church, the Chiesa Nuova, Caravaggio, and he's supposed to make an altarpiece, which is called the Entombment. And he produces this work, which all of the people who, who, all the other artists who are sitting there scratching their heads going, how did Caravaggio get this job? The very first thing they're going to be asking themselves is, well, first of all, it, that, it's really realistic. It's a little bit too realistic. Doesn't this guy know about Photoshop? 
I mean, how come the, 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 the complaint, of course, is that people look a little bit too real. So uh, starting with the first issue that Mary does not look like a, whether you have the big old guy in the corner whose uh, elbow is sticking out somewhat abruptly with that big kind of lump on the back of his neck. Um, Mary does not look like the mother, uh, the 20-year-old mother of a 33-year-old man as she does in the Pietà. Jesus looks uh, suspiciously green and definitely dead. And um, over here, his feet are definitely dirty. And so these little polishing things that artists are supposed to do, this kind of uh, uh, Photoshop, Caravaggio doesn't do. That said, uh, there's really nothing else that's realistic in this painting. I think it's fairly safe to say that this painting I don't think you can actually put a body in the ground with people arranged in this way. Where are they? Like, where is this taking place? They're like, they're like downstairs in the black box theater, all sort of against the wall. There is no logic or order to the progression of these figures. They're just, uh, they're all placed up against the front of the glass, like in our famous 64 bus in, in, in Rome. So there's really nothing re realistic in the positioning. There's nothing realistic in the way the bodies work together. And there is certainly nothing realistic in the light. I mean, come on. Is it morning? Is it afternoon? Is it evening? Did Caravaggio have a time machine? And go to a Hollywood studio and pick up one of those spotlights. Where is that light coming from? He is intentionally mixing these realistic elements that kind of are jarringly gritty with something that is obviously, evidently not of this world. And the brilliance of the work, the real brilliance of the work is in its composition. So you see how you have the two, the, the light that Caravaggio uses, which comes from an unseen supernatural source. You see how it hits the face of Mary Magdalene, who's standing over in the corner with this open mouth expression and her hand raised. Your eye will go straight to her because she's like a beacon. She captures that light full in the face. But notice how the composition works. Your eye starts to move downwards instead of moving up. If you ever notice in, 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 in paintings, your eye usually moves up, but Caravaggio makes your eye move down. You pass from Mary Magdalene, the two bent heads of the two Marys, the body of John, the body of Nicodemus, the body of Jesus. And it ends with that hand of Jesus dangling down towards the viewer's space, where you have the stone piece that is jutting out into your space. Now, it is very evident where Caravaggio got the idea of that body of Jesus. This is like, a, this is Art History 101. He's been looking at the Pietà, and yes, he's very interested in that body of Jesus that's hovering over the altar. But he does something that's a little bit more than what Michelangelo would have done. If you notice underneath the feet, underneath that slab of stone, do you see there's a big old empty spot there? Now, uh, this will be hard for some of you to believe, but once upon a time we had rules in painting. And rule number one about painting, you got to complete your composition. If you don't know what to put in that space down below there, you probably shouldn't be painting. You should probably be laying bricks someplace. And yet Caravaggio not only left a big, huge hole, you know what he did? He has Jesus point to it. It's literally like, hey, did you notice? I left a big hole in the painting. Now, I would be the first one to tell you that doesn't make any sense. If you look at that painting where it is today, it's on the wall of the Vatican Museums. It sits there with a bunch of other paintings. And of course, the big old blank space in the painting doesn't make sense. But if you put it back into its original placement, the original placement was actually, oops, the original placement was above an altar. So I've sort of reconstructed an altar piece for you. You have the original placement of the painting. Underneath it, you would have had the altar. And what are you supposed to have happening underneath the altar? You're supposed to have the priest celebrating the Mass. Now let's imagine the moment that the priest lifts the host to consecration and says those words, this is my body that will be given up for you, that big space is completed by the priest raising the host just as the body of Jesus comes down into the tomb. It's very, very effective. And not only is it very effective, but the fact that that, go that hole stands there gaping, it gives a sense of urgency, a kind of a you have to step up and do something. Caravaggio is not content just to have the story come down into its space. He leaves this open space as if to say to the viewer, if you do not participate in this, there's really no point to this at all. And so this is one of the ways, very powerful, very compelling, very engaging to the viewer, that the church found a way to take this troublesome and troubled artist and have him produce a work of art that would really be able to drive home, yes, indeed, this is the body of Christ. So moving from here, 
The next problem that they will face is the problem of intercession. And the problem of intercession and the role that saints play in the lives of the faithful, again, very challenged by uh, many of the Protestant denominations who are wondering about, you know, how can it be this isn't mentioned in the Bible? Why would I bother praying to St. Sebastian when I can just talk to the big guy directly? And there are a lot of different implications that are going to be important about this. But the one that, as a Roman who's been away from Rome from four days, so I'm getting a little Rome sick, as it were. Um, this is the one that I think is perhaps the most pertinent for us at the moment. The real issue they have, one of the greatest concerns, has to do with the problem of Peter. Uh, the role of St. Peter, the role of St. Peter as the first bishop of Rome, ergo the first pope, ergo the, 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 the beginning of the lineage of the papacy. So basically, many of the Protestants start asking the question of who died and made you pope, and uh, the answer to that is Peter. Now, with Lucas Cranach the Elder and some of these, some of these, uh, some of these printed uh, objects, there was a lot of mockery of Peter's and successors. There's a really one of the really very clever things the Protestants do, is they write these really funny popst builders. That first one I showed you had some rather questionable imagery of uh, a bunch of people showing their backsides to the Pope. In this particular case, you have what is known as the Christ and Antichrist series, where you'll have one scene in which Jesus is doing something holy and the other scene where the Pope is doing exactly the opposite. So there's a big, there's sort of a cottage industry in disrespectful imagery towards the papacy, and the Church is concerned about this because obviously it denigrates Peter and the role of the successor of St. Peter. And as it just so happens, in Rome, Peter has never ever, has never just been only Peter. Uh, Peter has always been paired with Paul, and I'll get back to that in a second, because the first thing I want you to see is this church that, uh, that, was, that was particularly um, chosen in order to focus the attention of the uh, 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 re the attention of the underscoring of the importance of St. Peter and St. Paul. That scene you see in front of you is what's called Piazza del Popolo. Those of you who have been to Rome, you know Piazza del Popolo. Um, Piazza del Popolo is the northern gate of Rome. So what you need to sort of topographically understand is the gate on the left side of the painting 80% of the visitors who are coming to Rome, that's your first view of the city. You cross at that gate, you walk in, you've been walking for 500 miles, you are so incredibly grateful to finally be here. What's the first thing you want to do? You want to go to a church, fall on the ground and say, oh, thank you God for getting me here in one piece. And so that church immediately to the left, Santa Maria del Popolo, is going to get, if 80% of the visitors are coming through that gate, then 80% of those visitors are going to go look at that first. First impact into the city of Rome. So they're really interested in making church, making sure that church has some very uh, uh, compelling, very instructive art. To add to it, that is an Augustinian church, right? So what order did Martin Luther belong to? Augustinian, and uh, where did he preach? Um, Santa Maria del Popolo. So they've got a lot of explaining to do. And uh, so basically the Santa Maria del Popolo gets extra special attention from really the Pope himself. And so the issue again, there's the Church of Santa Maria del Popolo, and the issue in the issue at hand here has to do with who are Peter and Paul to the Romans? We see them as twins. So in Rome, every year on June 29th, we have a feast day. It's the feast day of Peter and Paul. What are we celebrating? The day that Peter and Paul died. We believe in Rome that Peter and Paul, we've, it's a tradition that goes back to the time of St. Jerome, we believe Peter and Paul died on the same day. Now, if they died on the same day, that means, of course, that they were born in heaven on the same day. And if they were born on the same day, I think that makes them what? twins. And since our city was founded by Romulus and Remus, the picture on the statue on the left should be familiar to everyone. That's our famous Romulus and Remus and the she-wolf. The city was founded by two twins. And then the gold glass, the fourth century mm, object the pilgrims would, bid, would, would bring back, have the Peter and Paul laid out in gold, sharing the same martyr crown, because they are the twin refounders of Rome. And as a matter of fact, Early Christian art used to always, Christian art paired right up into the Reformation. We always paired the death of Peter and the death of Paul. On the right-hand side, you see the altarpiece painted by Giotto. Uh, 
that stood on Peter's tomb from 1320 to 1550. And what's on the left? Death of Peter, death, and uh, death of Paul. The, uh, if you right below it was the actual tomb of Peter, and it had a little wooden icon which you could lift so you could touch the dirt of St. Peter's tomb. The image on the left is the icon in which you see Peter and Paul bracing each other, two brothers, indivisible, who love each other and who care for each other. That's what the church, that's how the church always saw Peter and Paul. The Protestant Reformation separates the twins. The Protestants get very interested in Paul. The Catholics can't wait to finish building St. Peter's. And so it kind of sets this sort of strange dichotomy between the two. And so already in 1540, 1550, the Pope starts thinking, you know what? We got to get this Peter and Paul thing back on track. And so Pope Paul III, back in 1545, hired the most famous artist in the world, Michelangelo, to explore a new iconography where you would see the death of St. Peter and the conversion of Saul. So this is a nice way to hint towards the Protestants. You like Paul so much, remember that he converted too. So they put the two side by side, Michelangelo does the death of St. Peter, crucified in this enormous painting, would occupy basically a good chunk, actually most of that wall. It's in a very, very small private chapel, which is what they used from time to time for the conclave inside the Vatican. Peter is surrounded by this incredible crew of people. He's lying on the cross, and you see how he lifts his head and looks outwards? That was a very specific message always for the man who went into the conclave and came out as pope because after he was elected and they put on his white robe for the first time and he walked out, Peter watches him from the altar all the way out the door as a little reminder, oh, by the way, this is the job description. And then on the other side, you see St. Paul, who's captured at the moment of his conversion, which Michelangelo, of course, does in his own inimitable way. There are about 30 people at the scene, of course. Saul is lying on the ground. He's covering his eyes. He's represented as an older man. Michelangelo was older. He's working for an older patron. They're sort of thinking in terms of an older Saul. And Jesus Jesus is terrific. He's, he's sort of an extreme sports Jesus. Do you see him up at the top there? He's doing like this really cool kind of upside down and a drop. And he sends down this beam of light where everything else explodes from that space. So uh, this has already been done once before. And then they'll do it again in 1600, which is a jubilee year, which means lots and lots and lots of people will be coming in that northern gate. The Pope himself had his right-hand man, Tiberio Cirazzi, take a chapel, endow a chapel in Santa Maria del Popolo. It's a transept chapel. It's a very, very important chapel. And Cirazzi hired, first and foremost, as the first artist of the, of the chapel, he hired uh, Anibale Caracci, who was the greatest living artist at the time. So the altarpiece in the front of the chapel was going to go to the man who was incredibly famous, the Bolognese, Anibale Caracci, had founded a school. He paints this Assumption of the Virgin, which, of course, is designed to drive the Protestants crazy because it's a Marian doctrine. And you have Mary being assumed bodily into heaven. She's not some little light sylph, like an ectoplasm floating up towards heaven. She's a big girl with, like, the angels lifting as you can see the rockets working as they're bringing uh, Mary upwards. These huge figures of Peter and Paul and these attitudes of devotion. Peter tilts towards the viewer. Paul leans backwards. His foot extends over the altar. Paul was good enough to have a pedicure before he showed up for the Assumption, if you take a look at that beautifully arranged foot. The colors are lovely. Everything is cheery. After all, we're looking at a glorious mystery. And the side walls went to Caravaggio, who after his first work in San Luigi dei Francesi in 1600, his second work is going to be in Santa Maria del Popolo. He's got to compete with the most famous living artist, and he's got to compete with the legacy of the most famous not living artist. It is a really tough commission. And Caravaggio comes in, that brash, swaggering painter that he was, and he does things absolutely opposite of what everybody else had done before. So we're looking at the death of St. Peter and the death of, and the conversion of Saul in a way that Michelangelo had been sitting there scratching his head saying, I, I don't understand millennials. <laughs> and uh, 
And on the left hand side we have so we have the left hand side Peter and Paul, and then in the middle was this was this image of the Assumption. So we have um, first of all the this, the the image of Saint Peter. I like to call this work this uh, painting Men at Work, because you have four guys who are working. As usual, Caravaggio is completely uninterested in the setting. We know that Peter died in a in a horse racing in a horse racing circus in front of people. It was it was a big crowded noisy arena. But Caravaggio is like, yeah, not interested. He gives us four lonely men isolated against again a blank black backdrop. You can you have nothing else to focus on but what they're doing. All four of them are working, but three of them don't really know what they're doing. They're sort of endless, they're mindless cogs in a machine. You are presented, as you start looking at this painting, with a big mustard-colored rear end and a pair of dirty bare feet that obviously that guy is not seeing the same foot doctor as St. Paul. So scrabbling dirty feet and a big mustard-colored rear end. But why is that rear end there? It's a muscle group. It's the gluteus maximus, which is being used to lift the cross into place. Then you move to the next color block. He's literally color blocking, yellow to red. The red is the big red shoulder of the man who's lifting the cross into place. And the third is the green of the back of the man who is pulling the, pulling the um, uh, 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 cross up over his shoulder. So you have yellow, red, green. Every one of these men has their faces in shadow. All three of those men have no identity. They are really just muscle groups. They're just cogs in a machine. They are mindless, thoughtless elements who are just executing some sort of task so they can pick up the day's pay without ever asking themselves what they're doing. The, th the fourth man, Peter, not idealized. He is not some sort of sort of gorgeous Brioni model lying there like, oh yes, I'm, I, I, I'm an Italian waist here. He's a big, thick, strong fisherman whose last effort, the last burly effort of that man is to remain on that cross. Not looking at you this time. Peter concentrates entirely on the nail in his hand, willing himself to go the distance. Caravaggio's very stark, very powerful way of reminding us that that is Peter, i.e. the rock upon whom the church is built. There's a big old rock in the foreground, in case you missed that. Fortunately, in Italian, it's basically the same word, Pietro, Pietra. So this rock upon which the church is built, and if you just keep going a few steps forward, you will see where that rock was buried in the, in, in the church of St. Peter's. In the meantime, we have the, um, hmm, in the meantime, we have a non-clicking clicker. All right, there we go. In the meantime, we have the other one, which is our St. Paul. Now, Caravaggio uh, first started by trying to do something a little bit more like Michelangelo. So you can see in the first version of the, con of the conversion of Saul, you will see the image of Jesus who is doing a little bit of uh, extreme sports upside down m maneuver. He's not as good as Michelangelo for the straight down, but you see Jesus on the upper right hand corner of the painting on the left, and he's reaching down towards Saul. Saul is an older man. He's lying on the ground, covering his eyes, much like in the Michelangelo version. A powerful steed starts to run off into the distance. People are reacting. It's a miniaturized version of what Michelangelo did without the blue sky, but with Caravaggio's characteristic chiaroscuro land back backdrop. And then Caravaggio looked at it and said, no. And he changed it again for what has to be the most startling image of the conversion of Saul imaginable. The conversion of Saul apparently, uh, in just it's about a horse. <laughs> so you had to see a man about a horse. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It's a gigantic painting of a horse. So that, that, that two thirds of the space in that painting are occupied by an animal that's not a beautiful animal. It's not the chestnut steed you see in the other one. That is a workhorse. That is a sort of a, 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 a cheap rent-a-car there. That is, it's, it's something you just rent that has to go from point A to point B. The horse has no idea what's happening. The man who's holding the bridle has no idea what's happening. Only sign that something is going on is that little splash of color on the bottom. And Caravaggio, again, pulls out this amazing supernatural light which comes down vertically, directly from heaven. He has taken out Jesus. He has dared to show a painting of the conversion of Saul and leave out the main interlocutor 
right? Where's, 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 where's the guy saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the fact is, instead of putting in Jesus, Caravaggio uses that pure beam of light, the beam of light that passes over the animal. The animal cannot perceive the presence of God. Passes over the man who's just thinking about, I, I, I just, I really need to get home now, and that's enough of that. He's not, he's not part of the story. And that light finds its mark in a youthful Saul lying on the ground, no longer covering his eyes, but opening his arms to accept this transformation. So this, again, this imagery of the acceptance of conversion. You walk into Rome, you see this incredibly intimate view of a conversion. Not sitting around for fanfare and drums and red carpets and we're ready for you to convert now, but something that represents that much more interior change that happens when you begin to see the light. And Caravaggio's use of color is also striking here. You have the orange curus of Saul as he lies in sort of that red pool behind him. And again, what makes that interesting is that red, of course, mortality and, 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 and martyrdom and all the other things you could possibly want. But when you mix orange and red together, you get the color of flame. What does it feel like to convert? What does it feel like to feel a direct contact with the Lord? It feels like being set on fire. You feel this igniting that's taking place at the bottom, and from that ignition will spread out that tremendous work of the doctor of the Gentiles. Now, our last is going to be the question of intercession, which is uh, so the last one's going to be the question of cooperation, which is a really difficult one. What's a cooperation with your salvation, right? Now, this is actually it's like a, it's like a Catholic thing. You're supposed to somehow cooperate with with the salvation you've been given, but I mean, it's, it it sometimes kind of feels a bit like you're asking your dad for five bucks to buy him a Father's Day present, right? Like, I don't have any money, but maybe you can lend me some. I can get you some. Like, what are we going to do? I mean, yeah, Jesus kind of took care of all of it. And so the idea of cooperation, the idea of how we, how we are supposed to demonstrate, how we are supposed to show our, uh, our, our gratitude is a very, very interesting problem. And the one I decided I would talk about, the one I was the most interested in, is how we combat sin. How do we go about making a war on sin? And so if you're in the case of Guido Rainey's Michael the Archangel, uh, you, if, you, if you're really lucky, you uh, don't have to really do uh, anything. The angels, really, they can combat sin without breaking a sweat. As a matter of fact, most of us don't get to do this. This is Michael the Archangel. He's conquering Satan. He doesn't even get his little blue sandal shoe dirty. He has a very sort of calm, even though slightly, slightly repulsed expression on his face. Angels, it's really no, it's no difficulty for them whatsoever. And so there are a lot of images that they show where you have Michael conquering the archangel, Michael the archangel conquering Satan. Said Michael the archangel is blue. He has this sort of use of a blue. It's a dispassionate, cool color. Whereas that um, uh, uh, the image of the the satanic figure, kind of hulking out with his big, heavy hands, he looks a lot more ruddy, a lot more more passionate, a lot more uh, uh, a creature of, of, of the earth and of his, and of his desires. Um, but as I said, it's easy for Michael the Archangel. It's not so easy for the rest of us. And so a very interesting two lanes, there are two different developments in art. Um, one direction is looking at people who have to combat sin and I, just you, wh what am I going to do? This very, very, very popular subject matter of Saint Susanna, Susanna, the Old Testament heroine who is bathing in the garden. She's a married woman. She's a very beautiful married woman. She's bathing in the garden. And along come two really creepy guys who say, well, here's the deal, Susanna. Either you're going to sleep with us or we're going to say you did and you'll be accused of adultery and stoned to death. So pff, take your pick. And she chooses. She chooses to just take the accusation. It's two against one, it's two men against her, and Daniel at the very last moment intervenes. He interrogates them separately, which is a moment where lawyers turn out to be the hero of the story. Uh, you have the, so he interrogates them separately, they contradict each other, she's ultimately vindicated. But this moment, that moment, when she's cornered in the garden by evil, she's got nowhere to go. There's nothing she can do. So where does she look? She looks up. 
one way of combating sin, one way of fighting. When you don't see, you've got any tools, it's bigger than you are, they're tougher than you are, they're moving in, the really, really creepy one has got his hand, is like climbing over the bench, right? It's like, uh, go away. She wraps herself in her, in her white robe, that beautiful image of purity, that soft skin exposed, you're, 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 you're looking at it, you feel horrible for her. So what is she ever gonna do? She looks upwards, she looks up, she prays, she looks towards God, for help because she is helpless and help is given to her. But there are times when you can be a little bit more proactive and that's what makes her one of the most famous, and I hope you haven't just eaten, sorry if you have, that's a little awkward, uh, the one most, most, ex most often painted, most frequently painted images of the Counter-Reformation is Judith and Holofernes. Judith, the wealthy Jewish widow who when her people were threatened by the Assyrian general Holofernes, who simply wanted passage and tribute so he could go to Jerusalem and wipe out Jerusalem. While the men in her little village outside of Jerusalem were sitting around debating what to do, she grabbed a bottle of wine, showed up as his tent, got him drunk, chopped off his head, came back, dropped the head on the table, and said, your problem is solved. And so this is an image that becomes very, very famous, but in the hands of Caravaggio, it becomes something unforgettable. Caravaggio's painting, which is on the left, uh, has an extraordinarily beautiful Judith who is in the midst, literally in the midst of cutting off his head. The sword is pretty much through the bone and it's just coming out the other side. He has been taken utterly by surprise, that amazing expression of a man who was I'm pretty sure the evening wasn't gonna go this way. And um, grabbing onto the grabbing onto the to the sheet and the red curtain in the background which is a really important piece of information for you it means you are looking at something that is meant to teach you this is a theatrical scene look at this story and learn from it look at her she is not having fun. This is not how what she was going to do today. She had other plans, but unfortunately, Israel needs saving, so I'm going to be out doing this. Her whole entire body curves away from him. Even the dress kind of has a little pleat, so it moves away. But her arms are locked in a very, very determined position. It's not that I've tried this personally, but I'm pretty sure you can't cut off someone's head like this. So it's not about realism again. It's not about his realism. It's about the determination to do this thing no matter how much she doesn't want to. You see that furrow in her brow, which is reminiscent of that of David, of David and Goliath. They're actually often paired, the two, the two heroes. And the one on the right-hand side is by one of the most amazing painters of this era. Not only Caravaggio, our in-and-out-of-prison guy, but we have Artemisia Gentileschi, an extraordinary woman who's reputation had been destroyed by a rape trial when she was 17 years old, yet nonetheless redeemed her way back in that society through her gift and painting, where she was commissioned by cardinals and priests and dukes and, 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 and all this counter-reformation Catholic world, and she repeatedly painted these images of these beheadings. And many of us think, and many, many people in art history have suspected or, or have, su have suggested that the reason for the beheadings is because she hates men because men are really bad. Okay, all right. all right, 30 years later, we can give that one a rest. How about this? Um, she also paints as many Mary Magdalene's, penitent Mary Magdalene's. And I'd like to put to you that these two paintings, Artemisia and Caravaggio, both people who had a lot of demons that they had to wrestle down, remind us of a little something about holiness, which is really just not that easy sometimes. Sometimes you're going to get splattered with mud. Sometimes you're going to have to wrestle it down and saw the head off of whatever it is that your demon is. And so there you have that Artemisia where she and that hand woman have got him down and she's got her knee up, sawing her way through her head. Sometimes you're going to get dirty. Sometimes you're going to get messy. Sometimes fighting sin is really just an ugly, hard thing that you're going to have to do. And so we have these two strains. This very, the work of Anibale, the elegant painter, the painter of light and color, who tells us, offers us the road of prayer, offers us the road of, of, of turning to God in our, in our brokenness. And then we have Caravaggio, we have Artemisia who show us that, you know, every now and then we're going to have to get up and fight these temptations and fight our way back from sin on our own. So that we can, indeed, all end up in this glorious, and glo this glorious space 
of, of heaven. Michelangelo's Last Judgment, which was actually the painting that kicked off the Counter-Reformation, the Last Judgment painting uh, it's a, it occupies the entire back wall of the Sistine Chapel. One of the things that's very striking about it, one of the things that got so many people upset about it, one of the reasons why the painting got into so much trouble in the 1560s is people said it was the nudity, but it really wasn't just the nudity. It was the fact that John the Baptist, who is the first figure on the left-hand side uh, who usually ate locusts and wild honey, looks like Mr. Universe, and he's wearing a camel hair thong. Um, we have, uh, <laughs> St. Andrew is next to him. He's been doing a lot of squats. Um, on the other side, you've got St. Peter, who's looking fabulous at 70, but um, obviously forgot his clothes. I mean, basically what I'm getting at here is that you're looking at a whole bunch of sort of super-powered bodies, and that includes, by the way, that mega Jesus who's so so dramatically uh, 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 represented in the center. So the point I'm trying to make here is that Michelangelo was the artist who first began to show us what it means to exercise heroic virtue, what it means to cooperate in your salvation, to wake up every morning and to make decisions and to exercise that heroic virtue so that one day you will have a glorious body in heaven. And that is, really this, that is really the wonderful way that art was able to show us the way we put a picture on the refrigerator of the new dress we'd like to buy or the way we'd like our hair to look or what we hope to dye it into. The art of the, seven, the, art of the 17th century put before 16th, 17th century put before our eyes models and really beautiful ways to talk about our goals, our dreams, our desires to make our way to heaven, how to make our way to heaven, and really gave us a way to communicate without fighting, but to communicate through beauty. Thank you. Oh, I think you did fine with the technology there. <laughs> yeah. We actually had a uh, bishop from the Vatican here last year uh, who said, you know, in regards to the joke about the, uh, the church and, and technology that, you know, what do you expect from an organization whose most important communication technology is white smoke? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't it a lot of the nudity uh, in this particular painting uh, sort of rankled the feathers of, of uh, some high-ranking cleric who's actually portrayed in the corner of this picture a little bit. You know, never get the artist angry because you'll get painted into the picture somehow. Um, well, you know, so much of what you talked about really resonates with the, the mission of why the Sheen Center is here. Uh, one of our favorite quotes around here is Benedict the Sixteenth, where he said that the two best tools that the church has for evangelization are the saints that we give birth to and the art that we create. Uh, so just thank you for being here because I think these these conversations about art and beauty uh, is something that you know the church is really good at, but maybe just doesn't often have the the opportunity to talk about. And so we're just so lucky to have you here. Um, let's start off by uh, talking about a, a, a modern artist, filmmaker, uh, Swedish film director Ingmar Bergman, uh, who was not a person of faith, I think he identified as an agnostic or an atheist, once said that art lost its creative impulse when it was separated from worship. And I think that's really taken up in, in John Paul II's letter to artists, where he emphasizes throughout the letter that the church needs artists and artists need the church. Can you unpack that a little bit and explain why both sides of that equation are important? I, I think a lot of what, I mean, uh, the church needs artists and the, the, the artists need the church. I, I think this whole, um, the, the Counter-Reformation era really, exp it, it made that very explicit. The church really needs ways to, we need every way we can possibly think of to teach and to remind people. We say the creed every Sunday, but do we understand what each part of that creed means to us? And I think what... Uh, art helps us to do is to really, it's to unpack that and to make it f make us feel like we own it. It's a lot easier for us to understand something. It's a lot easier for us to believe something when we've seen it. And so art is a very uh, powerful way of, of, of doing that. But at the same time, um, one of the things that happens in this, this 17th century is we see a guy like Caravaggio. Caravaggio had the possibility of having a perfectly reasonable career. He probably could have made a lot of money doing fruit and flower and musical boys. So at the Met, you have the cute little musical boys in the, in the, in the picture, the lute players, the musicians, the fruit and flowers. He could have done fine doing that. But it's not Caravaggio's dream, and he really, really worked at this, his dream 
was to become part of this elite squad of painters to which Nibale Karachi already belonged, who get to interpret and to teach and to, and to manipulate and master the material of faith and present it to people. There's so much to sink your teeth into when you want to talk about what it means to, to be a saint. What does it mean to communicate with saints? What does it mean? How do we depict penance? And I, and I think this the, it gave artists such an incredible amount of fodder that that's why we get these incredible proliferations in this, in this period of just genius one after the other. Go stand in that large room in the Met where you have the Counter-Reformation painters. You have Artemisia, you've got uh, Barocci, Ribera, Anibale, Guido Reni, Guercino, all one room, a bunch of geniuses all working, all really rising to the fore in, in, in helping with this problem. Yeah, I think it, uh, I think it was Chesterton who said that you know Christianity is inherently a, a dramatic faith. You know, it's the drama of salvation. So the subject matter of the the drama of salvation is certainly an opportunity to to communicate that visually. Um, last month we had the first part of the series, and we showed a documentary called uh, Masterpieces, and it was really a profile of five young emerging artists in different disciplines, and almost to a person, all five artists said that their first exposure to the arts was through their family, through their parents. They all grew up in, in homes where art was very important. Uh, was that important growing up in, you know, with you? Is that where you got this love of art from? It, as a matter of fact, yes. I was, I was talking about that just the other day. Um, the uh, people often ask, you know, how do we bring back this love of art? And that was sort of one of the last, one of the little epilogue of the book was really the fact that you have art in your homes or art in in in, in front of you. We don't we don't have as many spaces for art in churches anymore. But when you grow up with, I grew up with um, John Bologna's uh, John Bologna's uh, Mercury a little baby copy of it in my living room and all, I, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen and I couldn't wait to go to Italy and actually see the work. We had uh, Fra Filippo Lippi's uh, Madonna and Child and Two Saints in one of the bedrooms and so this is one of the ways that art just became part of my life. I must say, and it's, it's sort of an interesting thing uh, that I was really attracted to mythological art. I guess uh, this is a little bit of confession moment but with the bright lights it feels a little bit like an interrogation. Um, I was, um, I was first very attracted to mythological art. That's what I was going to do. I was only interested in the mythology. I loved, there was no myth I didn't know in high school. I had all sorts of unpleasant nicknames because children think that's weird when you're that nerdy. But there was no myth I didn't know. Uh, I loved all of the, the the mythological images. I was really only interested in the Apollo and Daphne's and the Plutos and Persephone's and the really fun love stories. And when I got involved and started studying Italian art, I was sort of like, oh, what is this? Why do they always have that lady and the baby? Why can't we have like more Apollo and you know Titian's Venuses sort of lying here and there? And then I began to a slowly realize one of the very first things I realized is the money was in the other stuff that they were pouring the money into the maid lady with the baby. So I started to pay more attention to that because it was clear that that's where the patronage was going. But then, eventually, I began to realize that unpacking a painting of an Apollo and Daphne has a lot of fun truths. Those paintings have truths about you know how humans feel and love stories and when love stories go wrong, et cetera. It's an unrequited love. But when you start unpacking a painting that has the truth of Catholicism in it, it just keeps unpacking and unpacking and unpacking. I think I've been unpacking the Pietà for 25 years now, and every now and then I'll realize, oh, there's still something left in that corner. So really, it's it's the richness of that art that you, know, you can start as a child, but it just will never. S some of those works, they really never stop offering. They c they accompany you through your life and offer new ways for you to see it. Yeah, I think. Probably one of my earliest recollections of the faith was at mass, you know, as children do, I laying on my parents' lap, looking up at the ceiling, and there were these. I still remember the church that I grew up in. There were these beautiful paintings of the joyful mysteries, and I didn't understand what any of them meant. But it was almost like a visual catechesis, you know, looking at the stained glass windows. Uh, uh, and and I wonder how many people really that's their first uh, recollections of the faith, just the images that stay with you. Um, I had a barn and some felt. <laughs> Um, well, we are at the Sheen Center, so I have to get in a Sheen quote. Uh, Fulton Sheen said, you can only understand the art of an age if you understand the philosophy of an age. If the philosophy is nihilistic and ugly, so will its art. Can you talk a little bit about um, 
current uh, situations with art and do you think that is really a reflection um, of the artists or the overall philosophy of our age? I, I do agree fundamentally. I, I do actually f agree with the idea that philosophy drives art. I do, I do think that art picks up on currents of um, freedom, achievement, uh, turbulence, uh, dissension, nihilism, um, and that it, it does it affects how the mainstream of 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 art of uh, ma the mainstream of art that's produced. Um, I do think that right now, I, I, I think we have to draw a distinction between uh, art that's produced in sort of the gallery spaces. We have a we have a very interesting problem, in that art is produced for sort of strange areas, produced for for galleries, produced for exhibition spaces for the pavilions of the Biennale, we don't really have places in churches to put art and people don't really want religious art in their homes. We have very little of it. It's apparently not sort of sufficiently as mellow as having some tulips or something. And so we don't, we don't, we don't really create a, a, a place for religious art. Then to add to that, um, it's the fragmentation, so separating the two, sort of the contemporary mainstream art versus contemporary religious art. Contemporary religious art is very fragmented. There doesn't seem to be a commonality to it. It, it does also reflect in many ways the way that we have a kind of a, a, a sort of a strangely fragmented feel within the faith as well. And I don't, I think it would be, it would, it would behoove us to start to bring these artists together so that there's more interaction between them. And also, we, we just, you need a different kind of, we, you need a more active patronage. I think it's, it's also something that the uh, 19th century has foisted on us. The idea is that artists work in a vacuum. What does an artist need a patron for? What does an artist, you know, the gallery owner can maybe sell his work for him, but the artist doesn't need a patron. The, that's a, that's a, that every one of these great paintings we see in, in, in great Catholic or early Christian art, it, it comes out of patronage. The patron does more than just act like an ATM machine. The patron is a, is a person who's in, in, in a position to be able to, to, to allow the artist to experience and to learn uh, in, in such a way that he becomes a far more well-rounded character. Bernini, the patronage of Scipione Borghese had Bernini looking through one of the first telescopes at the moons around Jupiter. And then, you know, the next thing you know, you have this kid who's showing us how to make the invisible visible in these giant monuments in St. Peter's. So I, I, I think I think what, what we really are lacking is a sense of a very... Uh, a, a real patron class that, that is actively helping artists, not just sort of sitting back and going, you be you and whatever you want to do, but really interacting with the artists. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a small way, that's what we're trying to do here. And, you know, uh, we, part of, in addition to doing the events we do here, we try to create almost a community of artists. Uh, we have an artist in residency program. I think we actually have two of our young residents here. And uh, that's certainly something that uh, hopefully we, we can encourage on a wider scale. Um, one of the central theses of your book, which, which I love, by the way, is that in those moments of crisis, it was art that really, uh, for lack of a better word, came to the rescue and tried to refocus the faith. Um, could you talk a little bit about maybe some ideas that you have about how art could uh, sort of fill a similar role now in our in our current moment of crisis in the church? I, mean, I, I think I, I think art has a really um, a effective way. So I, I take people around the Vatican all the time of all different sorts and all different beliefs and backgrounds and everything. And you know, we all stand in front of we 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 stand in front of the Pietà and we start looking at the Pietà and people every I've never run into in my entire life was what is it twenty something career of the year of doing tours no one's ever said oh I don't really like this statue right no one's ever said the Pietà is ugly. And so there may be people, you know, there may be people, all they can think of is just selfie in front of it, but nobody sort of walks away and says, oh, that old thing, that was most, that was, that was underwhelming. I had one very irritating student, however, who said the Sistine Chapel was underwhelming, but so was his grade. Um, <laughs> the, um, so the, uh, the, uh, the fact is the, 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 a work like that, you can start by simply talking about you know, what's new about it, how Michelangelo uh, for the first time uh, uses a body of Jesus that's not you know, beat up like the German ones that came before it. 
But as you begin to just move a little bit further, people, it's as you unveil the, it's like a dance of the seven veils. So you can start, you start with the formal and you talk about this cool new thing that Michelangelo did. Then you think about why he might have done it. Then you think about where it was placed. Then you think about this shining white body of Jesus, which looks like it's going to fall off Mary's lap onto the altar. You look at Mary's face. She's got this expression. Why does she have an expression like that? Why does she look so young? Well, you know, that's a lot like the expression of the Annunciation, that, that moment that Mary says, I'm the handmaiden of the Lord, let it be done to me according to thy will. And entering into the story, the actual gospel story, while looking at that work, it doesn't really matter what your religious background is. You're going in, you're walking into a story of humanity, which speaks to everybody. And I think art really does have that capacity to speak to humanity. I'm not saying everybody's going to walk away saying, oh yeah, well now I obviously believe in the real presence. But at least we have a compelling and beautiful way of putting forward that idea. This is why the Eucharist matters to us so much. Because this woman had the son. The son was God. She, she's giving up her son. She's giving him to you. It, it, it doesn't that matter? And so I think it does have, I mean, uh, art has a way of allowing the best of us to come to the fore. I mean, I always say I'm very, I th I'm the luckiest person in the world in my job. I see people honestly at their best, right? How you are never, no offense, but you're never better than when you're on vacation. Like if I were working at Dwayne Reed, I probably would not <laughs> see everybody at their best. <laughs> but when you see people on vacation, you know, in Rome, they've just come from like the Prosecco and, 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 and breakfast. I see people at their best. And then I get to see the best come out of them because I see them in front of these works of art. So it's it's really a very it's it's a it's a it's a it's a good gig. <laughs> That's an understatement. Uh, uh, but yeah, I guess it is that power of beauty. It's one of the last universal languages that can resonate with everyone. Um, recently attended a uh, talk with uh, the Scottish composer and, and a very devout Catholic, Sir James McMillan, and he was talking about the importance of a need for the revival of of Catholic music, um, and. Would you think that moving forward is the answer um, a deeper appreciation for some sort of a neoclassicalism where you would turn to this type of art? Or is there a need for some, you know, modern expression uh, that can, to use your phrase, you know, stimulate piety? Uh, I, I know Pope Paul VI, I believe, was, was very interested even at the Vatican Museum of introducing modern art uh, I into into that same space for conversation. There's a, there's a lot in that in that in that question. I'm 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 momentarily distracted at the idea of trying to create the uh, Kanye liturgy, but um, <laughs> that I don't think the world is ready for that. Um, but uh, but so music, obviously, yes, music is well, one of the things about the Sistine Chapel is that the Sistine Chapel in the exterior, it's a very boring building. It's it from the outside. It's not that exciting. It's, it's a brick building. In the interior, it's got that amazing painting, which already has everybody, you know, amazed. Um, but the point of the Sistine Chapel was to bring you know, the papal court, so we're talking about 500 men, the highest ranking members of the court into a space where they prayed together. They prayed together for the church, they prayed for the souls in the church, they prayed for, they, they elected the pope in there. I mean, really, this is the most profound space of prayer among the men who are the most deeply engaged with the workings of the church. So once they locked themselves in that room, because after all, once they all walked into the Sistine Chapel, you had the entire hierarchy of the church in one room. And Cesare Borgia was really good at getting people into one room, like getting rid of all of them. So that was not a very good, I mean, it, you obviously it's a building that needs to be defended. So the fact is you get them inside, they're inside this defensive building, but somehow you've got to open them up to the Holy Spirit. And the church really, it has three privileged ways. It's the liturgy first and foremost, which is where the music part comes in. The second is music. Music has this tremendously transportative capacity, which Pope Benedict XVI was always noticing. And then he was much more, he's actually in many ways more sensitive to, to music than he is to painting. And then of course we have painting, and painting actually trails behind these other two. I mean, with music, when some of the music in the Sistine Chapel was really extraordinary. And so basically, the, the interesting question, the interesting fragment of a question that's kind of opening up, mm, mm, that's, that's, that, that, that 
that's, that's sort of sparkling in the back of my head is, you know, a, a, a beautiful music has to work in the function of the liturgy. I mean, it's not just Christmas songs or like, you know, hey, welcome to Jesus or whatever it's going to be. It's, it's, it's got, I mean, really, it functions as part of the liturgy. The painting is part of the liturgy. The, 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 the sculpture is part of the liturgy. And the great music is part of the liturgy. So in many ways, what we really kind of need to do is really get a better sense of the focus on what we're doing in that. In that, What is the point of all of us being inside that sacred space, evoking the presence of God? And so, yes, music is tremendously important, but I think it's part of a general sense of how do we evoke the presence of God in the Catholic Mass? Yeah, well, I think that comes back to, you know, Bergman's remark about the creative impulse was when art was separated from worship. Um, you know, you're bringing up the, the sort of the, the joke about uh, Kanye West, I think it, your, re your remarks about Caravaggio really brings up an interesting point because we've had a lot of conversations with different artists here at the Sheen Center and a lot of questions that have often been asked as, can you or should you separate the artist from the art? Um, and Caravaggio, I think, speaks you know, volumes about uh, a, a flawed, even a deeply flawed human being can sometimes create a, a masterful piece of work. I, I think many, uh, Caravaggio would not have been Caravaggio if he had not uh, been struggling with his own light and dark. And I think one of the things that's very poignant, Artemisia Gentileschi is very similar. Artemisia Gentileschi um, herself uh, got herself into a lot beyond the earlier problem of the rape at 17. She, um, she gets herself into a lot of trouble. And so you see a woman who is uh, constantly trying to get back on track and constantly falling to the wayside. And Caravaggio is exactly the same. And what is really striking about Caravaggio, I was just, I've been sort of intensely working on him uh, for the past few months. And one of the things that's so moving is that Caravaggio understands the qualities and the characteristics that are necessary for sanctity. And in particular, he recognizes that the one that you really, really need is a good dose of humility, and he doesn't have it. He's just, he's just missing the humility gene. And so the, b the struggle, which becomes so beautiful, so poignant, and so it resonates so strongly with us, is a man who, the light is as clear as day. Those slashing lights he puts into the painting, he can see exactly what it is he's supposed to do, and yet he has such difficulty doing it. And so that legacy that he leaves us, where he ha we have this dramatic trial of this encroaching darkness and fighting it back with the light and the constant struggle and the grittiness of every day, looking for the one thing that will take ordinary ugliness and make it extraordinary. No one, no one but Caravaggio would have been able to do it because he lived it so intensely. And I think many people have actually experienced, it doesn't have to be an artist to experience this, but many people have experienced, there you are, you say, stuck in a sinful state, sinners, all of us, I'm not very good at getting out of my sinful state, but I'm really good at this one thing. So let me just put all my gut into that one thing, and maybe I'll just keep doing that's my best, and the best I can give you is that. And in the meantime, we'll try working out the other stuff. And that's what Caravaggio, Artemisia, Mel Gibson was able to do. Give us these images. Give, they can see and they can point the way, even though sometimes you see them you know, bobbing underwater themselves, at least they can send up the flare to show us where to go. And I, I, I think those artists are, are, are tremendously precious to us. I, I really don't know what to tell you about Kanye. <laughs> Uh, well, here, I mean, it's so eloquent what you just said r uh, reminds me of one of my favorite lines in John Paul II's letter to artists is saying that ultimately the, the uh, this is paraphrasing, but the, the ultimate canvas is to create a masterpiece out of your life. Um, so, um, well, we were having an interesting conversation upstairs before we came down and without going too, uh, you know, off key here. Um, you said some really interesting things about how, you know, obviously a lot of the art that we're talking about now is, is very Eurocentric, and we talked about how other cultures have these magnificent artistic creations, but it was part of that legacy of the Greco-Roman uh, understanding of trying to capture the human form uh, that sort of resonated in a particular way with uh, throughout uh, church history. So um, Catholic art is incarnational. 
the only reason why we have Catholic art is because God became man. It's the only reason why we have it. The first commandment we are derived from the Jew, our Jewish, our older Jewish breth brethren. We are derived from the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, first commandment, codicil of the first commandment is, thou shalt not make images of anything that flies in the air, walks on the earth, swims in the sea. We're no images. And yet, here we are, you know, with museum upon museum upon museum of Catholic art, so obviously someone missed a memo. And the fact of the matter is, the reason why the Christians, it takes them a while, it takes them close to two centuries, but the reason why Christians make art is because of the incarnation. When God, John St. John Damascene puts it very beautifully, once God becomes visible, then you can make a likeness of him. And so this idea of God who wants us to know him, his self-revelation into becoming someone that you can see and you can touch and you can hold on to the hem of his robe and you he'll, he'll spit in the dirt and touch your eyes. You, he, 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 he sits at parties, he cooks up fish for his friends. He is a human being that can be known and and. and experienced a baby that can be held and that's what christian art holds on to it's incarnational and carne the word the word in italian it means flesh and so no wonder it's in that cradle this european cradle where already the greeks in the fourth century bc had perfected the representation of the human body so while the egyptians made really big sculptures that last forever i mean you know four thousand year old work that looks like it had a bad fedex strip is impressive the egyptians did not have that love of the human body they had the love of permanence, but not the love of the body. Along come the Greeks, and the Greeks are completely focused on the representation of the most perfect body they can possibly, as human beings, create. The Romans take those bodies, and they use them in myriad ways. And in come the Christians to speak to the Greeks and speak to the Romans, and they enter into this track of showing the body not just for the abstract ideal of being an Apollo, but the body that we are all supposed to share into, the body of Christ, the body of the church, and the body that we are supposed to be resurrected in in heaven. And so the Christians really, the, the European Christianity has an image of how the body is central to the, to the, to, to the story of salvation precisely because of Jesus' human experience. And it is the only place that really focused so closely on that for so many different centuries. And that's really why I, I, other, other, other countries, other places make beautiful things. But that kind of imagery, a pieta, has to come out of a European, out of a European matrix. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned John Damascene because we wouldn't have any of these slides if the, you know if he hadn't uh, sort of won out in the the great you know iconic Second class. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to digress a little bit into some lowbrow a question right now. <laughs> um, I, it made me very happy to hear in an interview that you had given uh, that you made. Uh, several times a remark that it all comes back to Marvel movies. <laughs> I am a... So I knew I was about to get that Marvel. <laughs> as, as, as a card-carrying comic book geek, I was wondering, can we talk a little bit about the role of pop culture art? Because in a way, uh, not to do any disservice to these magnificent works of art, but in their day, these paneled artworks were the graphic novels of their day. Uh, in fact, we had a, a priest here who taught over at the North American College who happens to like um, comic books, and they w he told a great story that they wouldn't let him teach a course on comic art, so he came up with the name sequential art, and they said, yeah, okay, you can teach that. Uh, so can we talk a little bit about the role of pop culture art in building on you know, th this legacy of communicating stories and ideas visually? I, I actually am really fascinated by the by the pop culture the pop culture art because Caravaggio really was he's a pop culture figure, his works he, that's what he was looking for that's that's what he was doing he was doing these little you know indie things for people's houses, and then he wants to be in a big blockbuster church painting so that everyone knows his name. He wants to be, you know, throw money at the picture, make the picture bigger, you know, do something. He, he really wants to be on the cutting edge. And I think that so art becomes very pulp, pop culture, both in the Renaissance, 
and both in both the Renaissance and the Counter Reformation and Baroque era, where this becomes something for public consumption. It does take it does because they're such public works. There's always a sense of responsibility on the part of the artist towards the public. So Caravaggio gets paid the occasional painting rejected because Caravaggio is getting a little bit too edgy and is leading his his very general public off in a direction that they ought not to go. And one of the things about the giant marble juggernaut, at least up until this, I I this first phase, as it were, of the marble universe, is that they've always kept an eye on their target audience. And so they've been very, uh, they, they've been very um, interested in uh, this battle between uh, good and evil, self-sacrifice, uh, and, and, and you know, every now and then when you start scratching your heads and thinking they're about to go off the reservation, uh, then you hear them sort of focusing on, and in a film, on one basically theme, which is, uh, 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 the life of one is not worth sacrificing. I mean, this, the life of one matters. I mean, the tremendous sense of the, 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 s the, the there's a sense of self-sacrifice, but you don't send one person out. You don't choose the one person, and then d it, it, mm, one can sacrifice oneself, but the society cannot sacrifice the person for the good of society. And it's it's a it's it, it's a it's it's a remarkable way to put values back in front of people. They've had very, very uh, good and, 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 and uplifting values in those movies. And so if you can, the, the Pixar is very similar. If you, you have movies that everybody's going to see that hold up great values, that people talk about cheerfully and happily, that's a really, really great thing. I have to admit, my favorite part, I remember I was sort of watching the first movie, the first Avengers movie, and was just liking it a little bit too much. And, um, and I was sitting there thinking, you know, this is bad. I, this, I probably am being led down some horrible path. And then uh, there's that scene where Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man, and Loki have all jumped out of the airplane. And he, Captain America goes and picks up his, his, pass, his, his, uh, his parachute, and he's about to jump off the edge there. And uh, Black Widow says, you shouldn't do that. They're pretty much gods. And he says, there's only one god, ma'am, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. <laughs> and and I, uh, I actually, I, 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 over the years, I've become friends uh, with one of the Marvel producers. And I told him that that, that, was, the, that was the moment where I was like, it's OK that I like Marvel. <laughs> And he told me it was actually very hard to keep that in. There was a lot of discussion about, well, you know, that's a little bit too Christian. And the, the, the Marvel producers had to go and explain to the distributors that um, this is the character. You know, he grew up in the 1930s, 40s, Protestant kid, New York. He's, he's, he's going to be using that kind of reference. But they had to defend it. They had to defend the use of that line. And they did, and I'm very glad that they did. Well, as a lifelong DC fan, I have to say, but shameless. Oh well, you didn't tell me that. No, yeah, that's <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no, I, <laughs> that was that was a deal breaker. <laughs> um, well, well, I'm I'm dealing with you before, and I found out that Dr. Lev is from Boston, so as a Yankee fan, <laughs> no, I don't like being up on this, this stage I mean, either. This, I mean, this, I mean, this, wow, we're just <laughs> we're building walls, not bridges. Yes. <laughs> um, shameless plug for a second. Next th this Thursday, we are actually having a, uh, an event here about pop culture, we're giving uh, Batman his 80th birthday this year. So we're having a whole event about Batman. You can get tickets on our website. Um, so uh, now Will that it be Val Kilmer, George Clooney, Christian Bale, <laughs> Robert Pattinson? Which one are you having? Ben Affleck, uh, well, uh, Adam well, West? We're, we're talking about them all. We're talking about them all. Um, but Adam West. <laughs> <laughs> that would be quite a feat. Uh, that would, yes. <laughs> um, so, so now we've just, now we've, uh, figured out that Caravaggio would have been hired by Disney to do the blockbusters of his day. Um, but, you know, and all joking aside, you know, Flannery O'Connor once said that uh, for the heart, you know, for the blind, you have to write large. Um, and I think whether it's Marvel movies or The Last Judgment, you know, art has a way of writing things large and shouting them out. Um, so... I want to give some chance for the audience to ask some questions. And while they're trying to figure out their questions, I've got one last question for you. Um, we started out with that quote by Pope Benedict um, about the saints and the art being the two best tools. We've talked a lot about art. I'm sure we'll get some more questions about art. But going back to the saints, if the you work in Rome, if the Pope came up to you one day and gave you a special dispensation and said, for a one time only, I'm going to allow you 
to proclaim one of these artists a saint, which would it be and why? Well, they've been trying with Michelangelo for so long. I, I do. I would. I, I, if I got a dispensation, it would be Michelangelo. I think he's led more people to the faith than, uh, than, than any other. Uh, Michelangelo also his deep, deep, deep spiritual struggles. He was a very deep man, deeply, deeply religious. Um, the reason, uh, the, the immediately upon his death, it was evident that the artistic world was looking for. Um, a chance to have him raised to the altars, as they say. And the famous story that after he'd been dead for 27 days, he shows up in Florence and they go to open up the tomb and Giorgio Vasari, who says he was there, and Giorgio Vasari, who's the biographer of, uh, he's a very important biographer of Renaissance artists, he says when they opened the tomb of Michelangelo, after Michelangelo had been dead for 27 days, he looked like he was sleeping and he emanated a smell of roses. And those are, that's, those are the exact descriptions of what happens when you open the tomb of a saint. And I was like, no, that's nice try, Giorgio. Um, now, Car when, when people have often speculated why, I mean, there are, outside of Frangelico, there are no sainted, artists and there are no saint musicians apparently it's just sainthood <laughs> and I don't there are no saint art historians either so <laughs> uh, yeah, it's fairly really just not not a field that produces a lot of saints but what it what 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 what, what Michelangelo was deeply disturbed about towards the end of his life and you can glean this from some of his poetry um, he was very worried about the fact that this tremendous fame that he had garnered the question is, had he done it for himself or had he done it for God? And they're evident, I mean, obviously this is a man who's very concerned about building his brand, and I think that that troubled him a great deal that he was often spurred by the desire for personal success. But if I, if the Pope said, listen, I'm just gonna be taking my cue from you, I'd be saying, then they make it Michelangelo. I did want to also say one little thing about the idea of art and, and this writing large and Flannery O'Connor. Um, in the, in the Counter-Reformation era, one of the things they do tell artists, this is an essential part of art, you don't have to look at a painting. Like the Catholic Church, there's nowhere in the catechism that says, go look at this painting or else, right? You don't have to look at a painting. A painting is going to get you to look at it because it is fun to look at. So it's just like the pop culture problem. Art has to teach and to delight. It's got to send a message, but it also has to be something that you want to look at. And so the study of whether you're going to use beautiful bodies or beautiful colors or beautiful composition, how do you get people, how do you delight people enough to look at your work long enough so that you can absorb the message that the work is trying to send? I think part of the problem of some modern art is that there also has to be talent involved. It's easy to <laughs> want to look at at some of these. But so Caravaggio doesn't make the list of possible saints. He's well, you gave me one. Okay. <laughs> just wanted, just wanted to yeah, yeah, the murder of Ren Renuccio Tomazzoni is a little bit of an issue. Well, I, I would always make the argument about Dante as well, but the problem with him is the people who are making the decisions, uh, some of those future popes he ended up putting in the rings of hell, so that's not a way to... Uh, awkward. Awkward, yeah. <laughs> um, so you notice a lot of these names happen to be an Italian. And so as an Italian-American, I just like to feel that, you know, we ended up really saving everything here. Well, yes. Uh, I should have just called it how Italians. There you okay. go. That, that's actually. So let's turn on the lights a little bit, and uh, we'll take some questions from the audience. If you can raise your hand. Uh, OK, oh, see right there. Oh, wow. Oh, I can, there are people there. There they are. Okay. Yeah. Um, start here. And one thing is I just ask that you, if you have a question, uh, please do frame it in the form of a question <laughs> just so we can try to fit in as many as we can. Uh, yes, ma'am. Is there, is there a particular question?
Is is there is there a question though? Is Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Oh, it's, it's, it's timeless. I mean, my point, my point about the art that was produced in this period and the art that's produced in, in, in other periods, a Gothic church made in the 13th century, it's timeless. It's for the past, it's for the future. Caravaggio speaks to just as many people today as he did 400 years ago when he painted, and I have a funny feeling he'll keep speaking 400 years from now. The amazing thing about the Sistine Chapel Michelangelo paints the beginning of the world and the end of the world. The ceiling is the beginning of human history. The, the wall, the Last Judgment is the end of human history. No matter when we're there, no matter if we're there in 1,200, 1,500, 2,000, 4,000, 8,526, we will always be between those two points. That pretty much the last covers judgment everything. is yeah. future. It is our okay. future. We just need to get some other questions in, ma'am, please. When I'm back next year with my new book about Michelangelo, we will tackle the question of Michelangelo not being gay. Next. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir, right here. So the Counter-Reformation, good question. <laughs> uh, the Counter-Reformation, uh, really, the, the taking the bull by the horns begins with the Council of Trent, which starts in 1545. What that means is that the church brings together bishops and from all over the place in order to talk about uh, church teaching, to reaffirm church teaching, to look at it in the light of the modern problems that the church is facing, and then to ask themselves, how are we going to represent this church teaching to a world that has other options? It's one thing to say, this is the only place where you're going to get communion, this is the only communion you have, now there are a whole bunch of other communions, then why is this one special? So they need to kind of begin to, they have to confront these, these new problems. The other thing they deal with mechanically and very, very carefully is the question of reform. So they first talk about concepts, sacraments, et cetera, et cetera, and then afterwards they talk about concrete things we have to do to reform the church. This goes on for about 20 years because there are people who want more reform and people who want less reform. And that is the period of the actual digestion of the problem and, the, and trying to resolve the problem. From 1570, 1580 to 1600, you see these first artists who are really, you can almost see the handbook in front of them. Okay, I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to do that. And that period flowers into the Baroque. One of the reasons why I got so interested in this period is that the Baroque is such a compelling and beautiful period. It's just, it's just, it's amazing the things that Bernini produces. But when you begin to understand, when you want to understand where Bernini is coming from, you have to back up and find out all of the ideas, all of them, all of the best ideas he uses was actually first floated, were actually first floated by a counter-reformation artist. So that's, it, it kind of continues, they, they one flows into the other. Does that, does that make sense? Ooh. Uh, and the church has to constantly do this. The church, the, the Second Vatican Council was meant to be another trend. The church has to constantly do this because first of all, we, we lose every, every once in a while, we begin to lose track of what we teach. So the one I always use when people look horrified at the dead bodies we keep under the altars in St. Peter's. St. Peter's, we have like random dead bodies under the altar. <laughs> De um, the um, it, it people are like, what is that? I'm like, well, you know, we all say at the end of the creed, well, we believe in the bodily resurrection, but how many of, how many of us actually think about what that means? Like, what does it mean to believe in the bodily resurrection? And so we have to constantly reteach that. And it's like every now and then the church comes out with this notice about cremation. We're like, oh, the church allows cremation. Yeah, we've done this for 30 years now. The reason why we mention it all the time is because the sentence that comes afterwards, yes, we allow cremation, the church accepts cremation, but we must remember that we do believe in the bodily resurrection. Our body will be restored and, and, and presented before God. So that's, we always need, always, always, we need more art to explain sacraments now more than ever. I mean, really, now more than ever. So yes, it's a very good point, and, 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 and you're absolutely right. Yes, uh, in the back.
Rich is a fascinating guy because he's so, ah, that personality that got him into all that trouble is the same personality that allowed him to look at what everybody else is doing and decide that I just, I don't want to be like those guys. But nonetheless, he looks very, very closely at Michelangelo and Raphael. When you look carefully, carefully, when you spend some time on it, you see his best ideas, are he, the idea of the light and dark comes from Raphael. He got the idea of light and dark from Raphael. He gets the idea of this breaking of the fourth wall that he does. That comes from Michelangelo. And these figures that, that are occupying, the, the, the interesting thing about a Caravaggio painting, again, go to the Met, go look at those two paintings they have. They're the same size you are. They're very iconic. He makes figures that are extraordinarily iconic. So Caravaggio, in some extent, he does look a little at ancient art. He does look a little at Michelangelo. He does look a little at Raphael. But he's so interested in forging that name, Caravaggio. You know, his real name was Michelangelo, so that was inconvenient. <laughs> like, <laughs> the, he shows up, he's like, my name is Michelangelo. He's like, hi, Michelle Roma. I'm Michelangelo. No, you're not. <laughs> um, so the... Um, the work that Caravaggio does is, is, is bringing out his, and, and this is, I think, a lesson to all artists. He does work within that framework of these large figures. Under, he's, he's absorbed what the Counter-Reformation wants, but he knows his own strengths. What makes every single one of these guys astonishing Michelangelo knows his strengths. He's got to paint a ceiling. I'm a sculptor. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a whole bunch of people flexing on the ceiling in a marble framework. Raphael, he's got this fearlessness. He's uh, anything. I'm, I'll try anything. And he brings that out. Caravaggio, he's a still life painter. He knows how to manipulate oil. So he adds these gritty little real life details that ground us into the actual world. It's a really... It's it, it, it's a it's a it's it, it, it's what makes him stand out. It makes him very unique. He brings his he does not shy away from his own particular talent. It's uh, it's interesting the way you describe that. Uh, I know when John Paul II first used the phrase "the new evangelization," he said, "You know, timeless truths, but with new methods and new order." Mm -hmm. Well, they were kind of doing the new evangelization mm -hmm. for their day. Absolutely. Yeah, sir. The first and the second one is an open argument among our, our artist historians because we don't have the document about why the painting came off the wall. So there is a, there are two different schools. There's the school that believes that for some reason it was rejected, but we don't have any document that says it was rejected, unlike the Santa Maria, the, the, the death of the Virgin, unlike the first version of Matthew, unlike the Madonna of the Palafreniere. So those three were overtly rejected. Um, the second theory says he took it down at the last minute and he decided to do a second one. Um, which in a certain sense makes more sense to me because that painting doesn't match the other one well at all. And so it's a painting that, that, that Saul looks a little bit more um, like his, his Doria Pamphili paintings, which is still a style that's a little bit of his earlier work. And so that he, he kind of rethought it and has the guts to do it. It's a very, it's a really gutsy thing to do, those three figures in the song. I, I, t I, I fall into the category that think that say he chose to take it down and to put up this painting that was so in your face an Ebole. And it pairs much better with the other one. That, that I mean, they, I mean, if you'd put them in there, <laughs> and they were sitting, you'd be like, what? What, what, what just happened here? So the other one really pairs, it, it keeps that very, very dramatic strength. You had your hand raised, you, and, and, and oh yeah. you've been trying to get it. <laughs> There's is always, yes, yes, you're right, there is, it's exactly right. I mean, there is always, that story, the whole point of the Bible is that it's supposed to be able to talk to us till, you know, the world ends. Yeah. 
I think so I think there there are um, um, I think there are a couple of um, ways that art can, uh, so c Catholic art today or art today in, in the Catholic Church needs to find a medium that is uh, more, it's user friendly. Um, Catholic paintings are, are very nice, but 90% but of them are gonna go into someone's house. So y it's, that's nice and it's good and it's lovely and we have millions of beautiful paintings from the Renaissance that are meant to be for houses. But if you really want a blockbuster, you've really gotta find a better way to engage in pop culture. So the idea of music, the idea of cinema, the idea of theater, the idea of a Catholic art that doesn't necessarily have to be the representation of the story of the passion or something, although Mel Gibson brought bazillions of people in to watch the story of the passion. It doesn't necessarily have to be so overtly Catholic. All it really requires is to have that Catholic imagination. The idea of the way that Catholics see the world is what Andrew Greeley described as an enchanted place. That there's always something that can point to something beyond. So you don't have to retread the same old story of St. Sebastian exactly the way it happened in St. Sebastian, but you can take stories of martyrdom and sacrifice and, 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 and pointing towards a universal truth, and that already begins to change the way the society, change the way the society feels about truth. What you really, what I mean, the fundamental problem right now is that you're dealing with a society that doesn't believe in truth or beauty or really goodness. So I would say it's much easier than that to take a step back and get people to believe in, in, in that there is such a thing as truth and there is such a thing as the beautiful. And there is a great space for artists to work in this exact moment because you are constantly surrounded by ugly, or flashy, or bland. Bland. Yeah. Yes, sir. I think uh, I, I, I always I always think that I always say if Michelangelo lived today he'd be working for Pixar. Um, this because in uh, in Pixar there are two things that are very engaging. One is there's a tremendous amount of craftsmanship. You can see in each one of the Pixar movies they've uh, set themselves a, techni a, a technical problem, a formal problem to resolve. So you know the movement of Sully's hair in Monsters Inc. The wet the wet, the, the the animation of things wet in in the Incredibles, it's it's actually really interesting that you see them, rev they revel in the challenge of trying to figure out how to do these very technical and in art history we'd have called them formal. It's almost like a Raphael type of desire to overcome problems, it, it like really formal problems and how to represent something. Two, they are. Uh, bound and determined that every one of those movies draws out a universal truth and value. Every one of those movies holds up a universal truth. So whether it is um, the importance of family, the sincerity of friendship, um, uh, this intergenerational sense of loss and rediscovery, they they draw out themes that are profoundly, profoundly existentially Christian and they draw them out in a Christian way. And so I, they are, they, I, they, they, in my mind, um, until the Disney machine destroys them, um, they are, in my mind, some of the best examples of brilliant, I mean, just careful, genius, jubilant craftsmanship. You, I can feel how much they love making those movies. I can, I want to be one of them. Like, cause it seems like it must be, they must be so proud of themselves at the end of this movie, look what we did. So you can feel that pride in their craftsmanship. And at the same time, they are telling stories that they are inventing, right? They're not, 
they're not telling us old stories. They're inventing new stories in sort of contemporary situations that draw out great and universal truths. So I, I, I that's that would be my answer. So I, I, I see your point, but I don't think that is a sufficient reason for the dearth in art. Um, people who didn't hear mass in their own languages, first of all, they all knew the, the intonations, and, so they, and they, they were parts that they did participate in. So um, the, uh, the, the mass was separated into different sections, uh, the preaching is in their own language. What's happening behind the screen, um, it's it's evident because people do, I mean, even if it were in Latin, you would understand the, 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 the uh, between the intonations, between the bells, um, you understand what is happening. So I think, um, I think the, the problem with the churches is we, we we've, um, we've lost that sense of frequenting the churches quite as much as people used to. Um, and making it much more of a personal space. Um, churches had a, had, had much more of a sense of being a sort of a, like a home away from home. Um, we don't have spaces in churches for art. We, 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 we don't really, and, 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 and when we do, we don't really exploit them very well. Um, and, uh, and, and despite the fact that everybody uh, hears the mass in, in his or her own language, um, it, it doesn't seem to be uh, engaging. It doesn't doesn't it doesn't it doesn't seem to teach people quite as much about the liturgy as one would have thought. So it's not really only a question of hearing it and being able to understand it, but really being able to feel it. And art and music and these other elements are part of what make people really feel that they're present. I think. I think a lot of what you talked about with uh, some of the culture being ugly or bland. In some cases, even affecting you know the sacred spaces in which we worship. You know, modern church architecture in some cases is not that conducive to not so much the truth. But another word that I would throw out would almost be the sense of mystery. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it comes to mystery. Um, well, we're we're kind of out of time, but I, I want to ask one question on behalf of um, I do know, like I said, our two uh, young Sheenars are here. They're here somewhere, Lucy and Aaron, but. If you, Dr. Lev, who surround yourself, who live around this beauty on a daily basis, could write your own letter to artists today, what would your encouragement be to young Catholic artists who are trying to be the next generation of creators? That, that, that Michelangelo, or, or hopefully not Caravaggio, uh, in some regards, uh, are, are trying to stimulate piety or, or stimulate that sense of mystery. I think it would be don't be afraid of letting the art, i.e. truth, lead you where it's going to lead you. And I, I would say that one of the things that makes art very, com that makes an artist very compelling, what we, we've been talking so much about Caravaggio, is that we feel him living it, as it were. We feel the, 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 the problem of faith and adherence to the faith on his own skin, as it were. Um, I, I, I think I can give you maybe the better answer is a sort of a more of a personal anecdote. When I went to University of Chicago and University of Bologna, I wasn't religious at all. I didn't care about religion or the faith even slightly. And when I got this thesis topic, I was like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Because I wanted to do Bernini's Apollo and Daphne, um, the um, uh, and so I, I, I it was uh, partially um, the uh, training at University of Bologna requires that you learn about the context of art. The way they put it is that you have to understand the soil from whence a work of art comes. And so that means you need to know all the components in the soil. So if I'm doing a work that's in a church, then I need to know what's happening in the church. There's no point in my studying an altarpiece if I don't know what happens at the altar. So gradually I began to, I began to 
pay more attention to that. Then I started doing tours of the Vatican simultaneously, and um, I, 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 I know you might not believe this because I seem like such a nice type B person, but um, yeah, everybody laughs. I don't. I <laughs> Um, but uh, apparently, I don't like to be asked a question that I I, I can't answer. So um, I would be giving these tours, and in the back of my head, I'd be asking all these questions in my mind that I wasn't able to answer. I'd be like, "What if they ask me this? What if they ask me that? What if they ask me this?" And so I decided, uh, in order to get a better hang of things, I would take night theology classes, and um, I started to you know begin to realize as I as I began to look in this at art from a theological perspective. And I began to, if it just, it was like, it was like when Copernicus looked at the heavens and said, well, wait, wait a minute. What if the sun were stationary and the earth were moving? It's kind of how I felt when I said, well, what if Michelangelo believed this stuff and all these things that he was doing were coming from a place of believing what they say happens on the altar and believing that these people actually existed? And once I hit that point, there was no question that I could not come up with a plausible answer for. There was always an answer that I could defend and make sound logical in my head. Then from there, it wasn't that much further for me to realize, well, wait a minute. If, if Michelangelo believes this and he's my best friend, why don't I believe it? And so my advice to artists is that's a frightening moment. The frightening moment when you realize the way that you've been living your life and you have to go and look at your life and go, all right, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have to make some big and somewhat unpleasant changes. And so it's a terrifying thing. Art is a terrifyingly powerful thing. And that's what Benedict was really after. He says beauty wounds. Power, the power that art has, beauty has to change you. Just like if you fall in love with someone and that someone is so special, you'll move to another country. The things you will do when you fall in love with a beautiful person is very, art has a shadow. It has a par as part of that kind of power. And so don't be afraid of that power. Caravaggio was not afraid of that power. It was terrifying for him to have to change his life. It was painful for him. He struggled with it, but he, he faced it. And that's what made his art so great. And so I think that the best thing I can tell you is that you'll know the more that you feel this, uh, this tug of art pulling you in a direction that you almost don't want to go, then you know you're getting there. That's really, that is, that is what art is supposed to do. It's supposed to make you vulnerable. It's supposed to make you open and receptive to new ideas and new concepts. And it can truly, honestly, I'm sitting here telling you, it can truly change your life. It's a beautiful quote. I it's the beauty is the arrow that wounds the heart and lets the truth in. Um, well, I could sit here uh, and, and talk with you all night, uh, but uh, you know, in your book, I think you referenced the, the, the Latin saying, art for art's sake, the old MGM logo. Uh, but you, you make the case and the very compelling case that in addition to, you know, rather than art for art's sake, it should be art to educate and delight. And you have done both of those for us today. So thank you so very much. Thank, thank you all for of coming. you. Thank you.